Welcome back to the Mastering Runeterra podcast with Jay and Bay, the number one source for competitive legends of Runeterra news and information. If you're looking for the best decks to play right now, right now. be sure to check us out on Twitter at Master Runeterra or in our Discord. And if you want to take the next step in leveling up your game, check out our Runeterra team on Patreon where we do weekly learning calls and one-on-one coaching. Now strap in and grab yourself some Boro snacks because we are about to start Mastering Runeterra. Welcome everyone to the Mastering Runeterra podcast with Jay and A. Uh, so Kato, here for anyone, I forget sometimes that people are listening at home and actually can't see us. Uh, Kato is filling in for Majin. He's off playing like Flesh and Blood or something. Nobody really cares. Um, <laughs> before we before we jump into everything, though, we have to thank all of our subscribers, all of our patrons. Thank you guys so much for supporting us um, and uh, letting us do all the stuff that we like to do, like make this podcast and uh, cool cool new toys that are coming to the website, like a leaderboard that is going to be live any day now, um, as well as our own like best of three ban tool, some other cool stuff. Anyways, thank you guys so much for supporting us. We have an awesome show. Let's jump into it. We're just going to talk about. Runeterra things, ladder, worlds, why Raid Shadow Legends is the truth. No, not that. Akedo, how you doing? How you doing, bro? I'm I'm doing great. Has the podcast gotten a Raid Shadow Legends uh, uh, sponsorship? sponsorship yet? Uh, it has not yet. Um, I would love the opportunity to sell out, but currently, mm-hmm. no. Our streams have, though. Majin's done it quite a few times. Uh, I had the offer. I just didn't pick it up. But... The podcast should definitely get on that. Um, okay, I want to talk. I want to talk about ladder, and you, I thought, would have some things to talk about the ladder because recently you decided to try and go from a brand new account to masters in one stream. How'd that go? In exactly one stream, and it, one stream. it worked. I mean, we, I, I eventually made it. Right. Um, what, what, what's the what's the air quotes there? What's that? I mean, I, I guess it did, worked. Did, I, it worked much better than any of my like no sleep till master streams. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I went in knowing that it would take you know I I I assumed it would take like twenty six like thirty two hours of like play to be able to make it from iron to masters. Um, you know, I I spent like five bucks to play like a, basically a competitive list of scouts. I was running like some weird six drops, but you know it is what it is. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it ended up taking a little bit longer than I expected. Um, you know, with two three hour naps in, we ended up at total clocking in at 46 hours, um, straight, which Jeez. was a long time, um, probably like an time. unreasonable amount of time. And you know, I, I haven't played like that much ladder in a while. That was, that was a, it's a lot of ladder, right? For a couple days, I Dude, think somebody that, that's like, some, that's so like 24 hours is a lot to stay awake mm-hmm. and play like 48 with like a couple of naps. Like were you starting to hallucinate and stuff towards the end where you started to like <laughs> kind of lose touch with reality? No, no. Unfortunately the, uh, the pantheons I was running into that were rolling, you know, like scout and lifesteal, uh, were not hallucinations. They were very real. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it was, it, it was certainly something. Um, so- it definitely, I, I wouldn't suggest it for anyone. It's it's Oof. not a good idea. Like, you know, after like eight hours, you're probably not playing as well as, you know, you should be, um, let alone, you know, 30 hours in or 40 hours in or however long. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Was it fun? Would oh, you do it again? Bad. Would I do it again? Uh, yeah, I mean, APAC, right? Maybe maybe I do it next month on APAC, you know? Oh, try you're, to, you're try to do it a little bit faster. You are mad. I do 24 hours. I've done a few 24 hour streams and like by hour 20 22 i'm like i feel gross and dirty and like mm-hmm. i just want to like i just want to keel over and die basically it's like i'm just like uh, i'm like a shell of a human uh there's they're they are rough and so i couldn't even imagine 48 46 hours like yeah you got to take a couple naps but like three hour naps are not exactly like it's not doing a whole lot for you yeah i mean I, at that point, it, you know, when you've been up for that long, like the three hour nap felt great. And like, oh, you know, I felt I a lot better coming out of it, but it's definitely not like a sustainable thing. Right. You know, it's I, I can't be doing this, you know, every other weekend. Like, it's just it's 
I think the thing that surprised me is, you know, I expected, you know, like, okay, I'm going to spend like 32 hours streaming and then I'm going to like sleep for 10 hours and then I'll be okay. Um, But no, it took like three fucking days and like it yeah. fucked my sleep schedule and like it was, <laughs> it was fun though. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a bit, I mean, it's a story. It's a great story. But yeah, you're, you, when people always are like, I'll catch up on sleep, your brain doesn't work that way. That's mm-hmm. not how you're like, you can't just stay up for 48 hours and then sleep for like double the amount of time that you normally would or triple or whatever. That's not how it works. Your brain doesn't just like power back on. Like, no, it's like you, you, you took your like car and like ran it into the ground, like didn't get an oil change for like a decade. And then you're like, okay, now I'll just get it tuned up and I'll be like, good to go again. Right. It's like, no, yeah, easy. <laughs> no, just throw some grease on it. We're good to go here. Uh, uh-uh. no, you're like, you, you gotta you gotta do some real work to get to get back take some days and stuff um okay so yeah. what did you learn though you played scouts basically the whole way so i played ari lulu and scouts only um ari lulu just because i think it's a ton of fun um and then scouts because i think it's like super strong um you know of course with the new two drops the sculptor the broadwing um the existence of vanguard sergeant just being like the most broken card in the entire deck uh, yeah. It has made the deck a lot more dynamic, I think, than it has been in the past, right? So I used to be a fervent scout hater. Now, I mean, you know, I can play it for 40 hours straight. Um, I still can't do but, it. Scouts, yeah. scouts is rough. I think the majority of my games were on scouts. I mean, I someone did the math. And, like, over the, the like, two days that I was playing, I think I accounted for, like, 18 or 19% of, like, scouts games on EU. Like something <laughs> fucking insane like that. Well, yeah, because scouts have kind of fallen off. I wanted to ask you about this. Like, because scouts was like the deck. It was like maybe mm-hmm. one of the most played decks, and it was certainly like one of the most powerful decks. It was just kind of crushing. Uh, Black Boss went on a big run and was like, if you're like scouts is free LP right now. If you're not playing scouts, you're making a mistake. But these days, I feel like the meta has shifted, whereas scouts is not as an as good of a p- position. A lot more like Pantheon running around uh people trying to beat it with like um what are the what are they like the tribeam decks or whatever things with flock stuff like that i think the issue with scouts right now is that like a it loses the pantheon but b and more importantly it loses to like uh the tristani yordle in arms deck because Mm, like they pop yordle in arms once and you just lose your board because like your four demacia costs more mana uh it gives you less of a buff and you can't refill as well as they do Right. So you really need them to like not hit your in arms and you need to be like flipping Quinn on like six or like you need to Quinn into four Demacia and like force down a board trade because it's a really hard matchup, um, which I think that, you know, especially on EU, you know, through Diamond, like Pantheon and uh, Tristani Yordle in arms were like far and away the most prevalent decks I was running into. Um, yeah. So yeah. like those but- being bad matchups, like definitely hurt scouts, especially since scouts beats almost everything else scouts is still an incredibly strong deck it's just when you run into your bad matchups and they're like so prevalent you know it definitely it definitely deservedly has a little bit lower play rate than you know it did previously yeah interesting that's that's kind of what i wanted to ask because like you say most of the decks are a good matchup for it those are the only two that like really pop out and then maybe some like i don't know iterations on them like there's a lot of yordle and arm decks running around um yeah. how how do you find the like the the, the like trundle nar matchup because that deck i find is really interesting when whenever i play someone that uh, like has a lot of reps on it like a good player basically i, I just feel like i lose i just it doesn't matter what i do if i try to rush them before buried and ice gets me um like i don't get there in time and if i try to play around buried and ice they just their late game stuff just eventually gets me uh, they start like turning their pillars into eight eight overwhelm things, um, that, and I feel like that deck is, I don't know, like kind of criminally underplayed. Uh, I can't tell I think, if it's actually good or not. I think Nartrandle is really good. Um, okay. it, it's a really dynamic deck. It has a lot of different things going for it, right? Like you can't really aggro it down because it runs like Mystic Shot and Thermo and a ton of two drops, and they'll fill up the board just as quickly as you do, right? Um, yeah. And if they do actually hit the concurrent timelines, then, of course, all of their, you know, poorly statted on play effect cards suddenly become really well statted. And it's like, OK, well, you high rolled a bull L knock and like suddenly I can't swing past you like ever. Um, yeah, when you know, you lose, right? comes down as, as, as oh a huge God. as a huge unit. It's like, geez. 
and like the issue is on the top side of it like trundle's hard to deal with when he's flipped uh if they're using like the the pillar to turn into like you know a dreadway um and then they still hold up 12 fucking mana or 11 mana like there's just it, it's I'm so sorry. difficult to deal with right um and i think that buried in ice is like criminally underrated i think that this yeah. card if you're in like a tempo deck that's able to uh force pressure off of like the buried in ice and like actually you know pressure ending the game off of it i think this card's incredibly strong and a lot of times like especially for scouts you just like play into it and it's like i hope they don't have it um you know it's just it, it's so difficult to play against because you if they like buried a nice into the eight drop the it that stairs that clears all your shit like, you're just gonna lose the game so you just can't play around it like it just yeah. it is what it is um i think yeah. the deck's like pretty strong but a lot of people say it's like consistency issues i haven't played enough of the deck to be able to like verify like yes this is 100 percent consistency issues or this is just like oh you know get good um but historically for lw piles which is he's the creator of this deck historically for lw piles are a little bit sus for you know normal people to play um but this one i don't know it seems real yeah, I mean, it's had a lot of staying power, right? Like, it hit the scene at the beginning of the season, and it's like, it's still here. I still see people see people doing well with it. I've really, yeah, I didn't put some time into it, because I'm really interested in what its, um, uh, like, lineup spread looks like, or like, what its mm-hmm. good matchup, good matchups, bad matchups actually look like. Um, because, yeah, the deck has a lot, to, a lot of play to it, and there's a lot of, like, you know, generating of different cards, and there is some, like, a little bit of high roll, action going on and so it's it's tough to like pinpoint what's the good matchup and what's not i've been playing a lot of Siver auction um on the ladder to quite a bit of success and that matchup like i've i'm the same as you now where i just try to uh you know rush down buried and ice i don't play around it if they if they get it off or they go buried and they drop and you just lose that's it it's kind yeah. of done and but I- if you wait you just auto lose basically yeah, Siver, I assume that you have to, like, look for a kill on, like, seven or eight. Man, it's like, that's that's a... And, like, eight is so hard to kill them on because they're playing, like, you, you know, like, four Damasi or something, right? And then they play out an extra blocker, which is the pillar, and they still hold up a ton of mana. And it's like, oh, fuck me. Um, but, yeah, no, I think Siver's a really strong deck, too. Uh, kind of overshadowed by, you know, again, Pantheon and, like, the Strasana Fey deck. Um, but in general, I think are a really solid deck that has game into almost everything. It's a very, uh, it, it's a very rewarding deck. I think, you know, the people who are very good at Sivir will consistently do very well with it. Um, and I think that's really nice. I found that my win rate with, uh, Sivir Auction has gone up quite a bit the more that I've played it. Um, and I think one of the things I started to do is keep my champions more like definitely Sivir. I think I was like maybe mulliganing back a little bit more and not digging for auction as much. I'd keep things like the new two mana challenger and um the the two drop that gives barrier or or like something yeah I think that like combination I thought was like really cute and and fun. But like auction's just busted. Like auction's basically Zoe. That's that's how I see auction. Like auction just comes down and immediately generates value. And if you don't deal with him, like he'll probably win the game. If the like if the second landmark goes off, like how often do you lose those games? It's 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 pretty low. Like if the second landmark goes off, you win a lot of those games. Like if your opponent also gets the second landmark to go off, like you're just in trouble, right? Um, and, and he's a, a two two that beats face that becomes a three three beats some more face combos nicely with everything. Um, and so I don't know how aggressively you should be. Uh, mulliganing or that other people mulligan for auction but things that aren't auction and sivir that i want my opener there's like there's not that much that it like drops off pretty quickly i like having the one drops i like getting the curve going as well um and then also the sergeant is obviously like really good Um, yeah everything else is kind of like yeah i think like seeker broadwing um you know the existence of sergeant is really nice but yeah you really do like like the premier hands are ones that include auction in them right um and i i almost always keep sivir just because sivir's great you know sivir applies a ton of pressure on the turn that she comes down she's you know pressuring ending the game she's just so good um yeah yeah. Uh, i undervalued sivir quite a bit 
because <clears throat> it always feels like you could like chump block her, right? It's like, no, I'll just throw a, a one one or a two one in front of her and like, ah, it's fine. But what you don't realize is that one, she's like an abyss, aka she's like, she's either hitting for five, which is a huge amount of damage, or she's killing something every turn, which is huge. And she also levels herself up really quickly, which is very important because a lot of times that's how you're winning the game is through auction, just doing silly things, or sorry, uh, Sivir doing silly things by giving your whole team like quick attack or uh, an over overwhelm quite often. And if you're not out there pushing damage with her, it actually takes you a decent amount of time to level her up. So that's why, yeah, I like slamming her on four and just getting her going. Um, and even if, you know, the first one might die or get dealt with, the the damage that she accrues that levels up like the next one that'll that'll win the game. Yeah, Sivir's yeah. fantastic. Sivir's so valuable. Plus, uh, you know, in that deck, you have a lot of units that have like two attack, three attack. Um, you know, Sivir having five, like A, flips her really quickly, but B, makes stuff like your concerted strike that much more Absurd. threatening right you know if yeah. i have like a you know something with two attack and something with three attack my concern strike just isn't scary especially against decks like pantheon um so like sivir just provides so much value to that deck you know you know once she flips like you're basically just saying i'm going to only get favorable trades on board from here on out like you just if i if it's my attack token you're just giving me your board every turn where you're going to die yep um yeah, no, it, it, Sivir is so powerful. I, I think that, you know, combined with Akshan, if I were to make, like, a champion tier list, I think that I would put, you know, like, Zoe and Akshan as, like, the two best champions in the game. And, like, Sivir's, I don't know, top 10 for sure, right? Like, they're all very strong. Yeah, yeah for sure. I think that people criminally undervalue or, like, attempt to kill Sivir. I think, like, it seems really difficult to do. And, I mean... To be fair, if you try to do it and it doesn't work out, then, you know, you lose a lot of tempo and you might just lose the game. And because of that, though, I feel like people just kind of just don't try to go for it. And, like, the, the action server deck doesn't have that many ways to protect her. Like, Sharp Sight is, like, the best way. <clears throat> and then, like, Absolver gives, like, a plus one toughness. Not really that scary. So, like, there's not that much outside of that. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, people would rather, you know, kill something like, a, like an Akshan or uh, a merciless hunter that they know they can kill and they just don't even bother trying to kill Sivir. Whereas I think if they if they did, they might have some more success in, in some matches. It's definitely like an, an angle of attack against that deck. Like I don't do it either, but I think it's an angle of attack against that deck that people don't consider nearly as often that your Sivir just gets to chill there and like keep just doing stuff. Um, and like you say, it's such it's so key to the deck um, that just allowing that to happen just, Kind of lets her lets the deck do its thing and go off. Um, For sure, I'm I, I'm often surprised. I, I think an interesting thing uh, about Sivir is just that so often, depending on the deck you're playing, especially if you're in Ionia or Noxus, a lot of times you don't want to kill first Sivir, right? You want to pop her spell mm. shield. Um, you know, if you're in Noxus, you want to like put a little bit of damage on her, and then you want her to stay on board for the rest of the game. Uh, because then your opponent like always has to worry about you being able to interact with her. You know, whether it's with Palm or Will or Homecoming or Flock or Scorched Earth, like whatever it is. Uh, a lot of times you want to just hold it hostage so your opponent can never commit like Absolver onto her. Um, exactly. But at the because like the moment you kill her and then they get to drop like fresh Sivir, it's like, OK, well, I spent like three cards on this and now, you know, you just got your Sivir back. You just did nothing. Yeah. But even so, yeah, like, that's... even if you get rid of Sivir, like, Akshan's landmark, like, the second one, right? You know, either you could just, like, draw two cards, which is, of course, great. Um, but being able to just bring back Sivir and, like, give their whole board vulnerable is something that people don't use nearly enough. Uh, and it's just so powerful, right? Yeah, the the plus two, plus two spell shield as well was mm -hmm. one that I noticed Henneke was using a lot. He was like, just, you know, do the math, boop, like, pump the team spell shield pump my Sivir a bunch, kill you. Um, yeah, because you're, you're winning with Absolver a lot of the time. You're either overpowering them with um, like just a bunch of units and rallying, or you're just uh, Absolvering on your Sivir for a huge turn. And um, yeah, good pointing out that like it's not so much killing Sivir, but yeah, at least popping the spell shield, it, it gives you, as the Sivir auction player, it gives you so much pause. Because now mm -hmm. if you commit, like you say, the Absolver to Sivir, she gets killed or stunned or whatever 
like your team's going to get blown out and like you probably just lose the game right there. And so it's really tough to do. Um, you really got to, you know, NA shard it up and just if they have it, they have it <laughs> sometimes. Um, but, but yeah, it makes your life so much more difficult. Just her not having spell shield, you know, makes you have to play so much more cautiously and really changes the d- dynamic of the game. Um, and maybe there aren't as many decks out there that are able to deal with her at quick speed. Um, but if you are able to, um, even if you have like, I don't know, like one, three sisters in your deck, you decide like, okay, I'm just going to get rid of the spell shield. So for the rest of the game, my opponent has to worry about this three sisters in my deck. Uh, because if I play it on their big attack here, when they go for the absolver, like they're in a bunch of trouble. And if they don't go for the absolver, they, you have so much more time. To, yeah. to, to play that game. It buys you so many turns, right? You know, mm-hmm. in, in you know, with stuff like a wallop coming out, like, you know, suddenly it becomes that much yeah. harder, right? Um, so a lot of times, like, as a Shiver Auction player, if they are holding your Shiver Hostage, a lot of times you have to, like, you know, YOLO your Absolver on someone else, you know, especially if, you know, like, if, if you have, like, an undamaged Auction, like, sometimes that's your Absolver target now. And it's like, okay, I just need to push, like, seven damage here. I hope it works out. And, you know, it's just, you just kind of have to hope. Um, it's definitely rough, but that's what I love about Silver Auction is as far as like Demacia goes, it's one of the more difficult decks. Uh, it has a lot of play to it as a lot of uh, nuance to its lines. And I love that because a lot of other Demacia decks are just kind of, you know, play biggest unit and, you know, like float one turn. So you're only have mana for the rest of the game. And then, you know, I, yeah, you just, yeah. How much mana do I have? Five. Okay. I, I play my five drop then. Six mana? Okay, I played my six drop. And it's just, I don't know. There's not as much to it. Um, yeah. But Silver Auction has not like wild that. lines. Yeah. Wild yeah. lines. There's so much crazy stuff. Like, how many times have you, like, killed someone with a Silver spell? Like, I've, I've had some really cool ones where, like, I had to put Silver, like, opponents at five, put Silver spell on the stack and, like, kill their two units with, like, single combats, killing my only two units, uh, like, my Silver and something else to, like, hit them in the face for five. Um, or like I was just playing against Lurk and uh, I forget what happened. I don't know if I made a mistake or, or something happened, but all of a sudden I was going to lose this game. Like it was done. Um, there was just like, they have a bunch of Lurk units. I can't get through and I'm just dead here. And so I had to just like YOLO the Sivir spell and hope that I hit them twice. They're at two. Hope mm-hmm. I hit them twice and I got them. And I was like, ah, I love this deck. Um, or just like Concerted Strike, all kinds of weird stuff with Concerted Strike and Overwhelm and like, there's a lot of really fun, interesting lines. When to make like the burst sand soldier and attack with it, the ordering of things with Sivir. There's, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. The, the skill expression is extremely high in that deck. Um, and yeah, I love it too. It makes it a lot of fun. I'm I'm concerned though. I, I brought it to, I really liked it on the ladder. I feel like I've been able to beat uh, just about everything. Like mm-hmm. it, not everything is a good matchup, but you have game if you, almost if, everything, right? If you, yeah, you got game to everything. If your if your draw kind of lines up, and if they ever, God forbid, they ever stumble, um, you can get you can get anyone, no problem. Bring into a tournament though. I, I did recently, like last week or something, and I don't know. It just didn't feel nearly as powerful or or nearly as good. Um, perhaps because there's a lot of Demacia or anti Demacia, like full Demacia or anti Demacia lineups running around, and it's not great into those right it doesn't love playing against uh pantheon but then obviously anyone that's coming packing for anti demacia is you know you're not gonna have a great time uh, i'm curious have you played it at all in any tournaments um or thought about bringing it in lineups i haven't bl- brought it recently in tournaments but i've definitely considered it you know some people are having success with it kind of being like their third demacia deck um I-, I think it's definitely it definitely has its place but you know being unfavored into stuff like pantheon or like you know, not really crazy about your Yordle and Arms matchup. Um, or like, you know, accidentally getting hit by the people who are targeting scouts. Like there's, you know, it, it catches a lot of strays that definitely makes it, you know, a little bit, a, a little bit less secure to just bring. Um, but, you know, if you are just looking for like a solid third deck, it genuinely has game into almost everything. Um, I think that the only yeah. like really fucked matchups are like Scion. But I mean, who who plays Scion? That's not a real deck. I think you have a game in yeah. almost everything else. Um, I guess like maybe maybe like Brom Galio is bad for you. But again, who yes. plays that deck, right? 
that's so funny. I played both of those. I played like maybe three games this morning before this podcast, and I played both of those. <laughs> so <laughs> was so like I was like gonna go talk to Kate on a letter, stupid. <laughs> Just got body, got works by both of them. It was like last night I uh, I climbed from like 150 LP to like 350 LP. I was like feeling all good about myself. I was just was just farming everyone, killing everyone. This morning was like, yeah, uh, Braum, Galio, and uh, Scion, and just got just got pretty wrecked. It was like, hmm, that's rough. That's be, rough. Uh, yeah, like two out of three did not feel good. I, mean, uh, I, think, wanna, I think I lost that third one too. If you want to climb, the easiest way to climb is playing at night in like slightly degen hours. I think like yeah. two p.m. CST. That's when, like, you're you're farming, you know, like, uh, the the OCE players. It, it's it's a lot more free. I'm telling you. I, Wait, two p.m. or two a.m. Two a.m. Sorry, two a.m. Like CST, yeah. which is what, like, midnight your time. Um, yeah. You play was, that for I, like three hours. It's like the easiest climbing of your life. <laughs> yeah, I played. I think I was playing like ten. Maybe I started around ten p.m. my time, and I went to like. 1 a.m. or something mm-hmm. and yeah i was just being everything and everyone why do you think that is because it there is different because definitely the the people that i was playing like I, I also played a couple games uh like midday and you know i'm getting like the black bosses the uh uh the m tucks like people that are like top 10 top 20 who are like you know known good name players is that the reason why because in general, the majority of us are playing in the middle of the day, not like the DGEN super late night. Because sometimes, though, sometimes super late at night, it's just the, like our us DGEN. Mm-hmm. It's just like the killers that are like up late at night playing. There's not like a lot of casuals. It's hard. I, I think that I think that like the hardest time to climb is like, you know, the, the four hours before that time. Right. Because I think that that like evenings mm. later on evenings. is when there's a lot of like really you know a lot of really scary players but also like metas develop depending on what time you play during the day right like i swear there's a different meta for like you know daytime players versus like nighttime players um yeah i swear it feels that way it doesn't make any sense logically but like it, it feels that way like it, it, it once you start running into like... like the same like five players over and over and over and it's like Oh, well, none of these guys play during the day. So obviously, you know, they, they're not impacting like the meta in that way. So I don't have to worry about them if I'm playing during this time. But um, in general, I think that like night, you know, A, you're getting like the people who are like tired as hell, um, you know, because they've been up forever. Um, yeah. But also you're starting to pick up, you know, like, you know, people from other regions that are, you know, like just waking up or something like that. Uh, I, I feel like it's just kind of a sweet spot. Where like no one's really playing their best, um. So if you are, it's easy. Yeah, and like it, again, it doesn't make like a lot. Like I can't scientifically quantify it, mm-hmm. but it does seem like it, you know for season after season, it seems like that's how it's been. Because I've had the same results. Other people have had other like you know similar um, experiences. And so it definitely seems like there's something going on there. Yeah, but I disclaimer, your mileage may vary. You know, you might like yeah. play, you know, at that time and run into Jason Florent like six games in a row and just like don't add you us. know, give him and the just got a bunch of free LP. Yeah, yeah. give him the LP. <laughs> <laughs> um we're speak speak to me about uh ladder climbing and stuff. Um so for anyone who doesn't know, you top eight in worlds last year. Um well, are you you got your eye on it again this year what are you what are you thinking are you does it make you hungry to like get back there and go again was it fun or are you kind of like are you, you feel confident that you can make it back what, what are your thoughts on it well, it was a ton and of how fun that translates to this to this uh qualifying from this season yeah i it was a ton of fun right and but i i think that i think i've kind of been affected by it in that like you know i already not only qualified for worlds, but you know, I made it out of like the top 64 qualification. I made it into like the top cut and then I top eight it. Right. Like I made it out of groups. So it feels like I had so much success. that like, I'm looking at worlds this year. I'm like, I have to at least repeat that. Otherwise it's, it's, you know, a failure, right. I have to at least qualify. I have to at least top cut it. Which um, is insanely hard. Yeah. It's, it's minimum, you know, it's, that's kind of like my expectation, which is kind of setting yeah. myself up. Right. Like it's incredibly hard. There's incredibly good players that like didn't end up top cutting, right? Um, or you know ended up on yep. that bubble seat and didn't you know quite get the chance to play, 
you know, through one person's fault or another. Um, but no, so I mean, I'm definitely, I definitely have my eye on it, right? Like, it's definitely something that I plan on qualifying for. Um, I think that it's hard right now, just because we're sort of in like a lull, where, you know, we're in this two and a half month long season, you know, that is going to have like right? a seasonal eventually. I don't know. It feels like it's been. When forever, was the right? last one? Uh, have we had one this year? Was it we had one in January, right? It was, it was like February, right? I think it was like beginning of February. Okay. That would make sense. Um, so February, that's... March, March to April, April to May. It's a full three months. Yeah. yeah it's a full three it's, months. It's rough. It's rough. Um, because of that, like, it, it's hard for me to be playing like super competitively. Cause like if I climb to like 800 LP right now, um, which I've never really been a ladder grinder before. I've never, you know, like climbed to insane LP, you know, I've been like front page multiple times, of course, but usually it's when the front page is like 400 LP, not like mm-hmm. 600. Um, but Do like, you find that it's harder going from like three to four from like four to five or five to six. Like, does it get uh, more difficult as you get higher? I feel like, I feel like getting up to 400 is like pretty free. I think like it's yeah. just a matter of like games played. Um, but after that, works, yeah. like your gains are so fucking bad. It's literally like plus 15, minus 25, minus 28. Like it's just insane where you have to have an insane win rate of like 68% just to like break even or like barely climb. Um, so like just the sheer amount of games that you have to play after that point um and then if you like go on a loose streak if you lose like five games in a row it's like that's literally hours out of your life that you just lost it's just it, yeah. it, it, it's so it's such an incredibly negative feeling to try and climb in that for me personally you know i really have to be like on a heater you know I'll, like win several in a row and i lose two in a row and i'm like all right i'm done for a while you know i'll come back in a couple days which isn't conducive to climbing that's not how like you know the most of the rank one people do it um yeah i have a lot I'm, of trouble just... with it I don't know how those people do it, frankly. They're they're animals. Um, but yeah, okay. So so I have a couple thoughts on this. So one, uh, I'm the same. I'm the same. It's it's uh, we're like I'll I'll go on a heater, and then I'll lose like I don't know three out of four, and I'll be like I'm done. I'm washed. It's over. <laughs> it's all done. Um, I can't climb with anything. Can't buy a win. It's terrible. And I did this. I literally did this this season. And then I went and looked at my stats, and like everything was like sixty five percent win percentage or like higher. And I was like, oh, I'm just like not seeing things clearly i'm doing like i'm being like uh i don't know what do you call that like results biased or whatever like mm-hmm. short-term short-term thinking um and i see that with a lot of people though like you just get frustrated all of a sudden really easily and i'm like you know what are you actually like what's your win percentage out there? like uh let me see uh 60 like yeah like that's actually like a good win percentage and but here's the thing though like you're still losing 40 percent of the time it's still a huge amount of losing you're doing even with a good win percentage um and so like i think people should keep that in mind one number two i am worried about this world um so we don't have enough information about it on it currently but riddle me this worlds was in september last year right yeah um and and so they they only have so much wiggle room on where they can put worlds because of all the other riot games because of tft because of league because of um valorant and everything else they have going on, they can't just slot it in wherever they want. And that's the reason we don't have a date yet. So, oh, I guess, yeah, okay. So this is the first season that qualifies for Worlds. May. Next one, June, July. Next one's July. Uh, August, September. So maybe, maybe we get three, and then Worlds, if it's going to be in September, October. The next, the next seasonals would have to be November, And then we do Worlds December if you want to get four seasonals in. Which, one, I don't think they're doing because they take December off. Yeah. Right? They literally take, like, multiple weeks off in December, right? Yeah, they take half of it off. So, like, it'd be kind of tough. I don't know. Like, like, they could do early November. So, what I'm saying is we're going to have three seasonals, maybe four. Maybe four if there's like some finagling or whatever, but I think it's very likely we have three, and that is not a lot of time to qualify for worlds. I almost feel like they're gonna have to do four because because last year it was like last time was like six or something, yeah. remember? They like and it was like squeezed multiple in, right? 
There was like yeah. one that and was like had... six weeks, so that they could like get another one in, right? Yeah, something like that. It was it was getting it was getting small. But and like remember though, it took your top two finishes from the ladder. Mm-hmm. So like, imagine you have three seasons. Like what? Like I mean, imagine you just like took one season off, or also like with qualifying through seasonal points. Um, you know, imagine you just bomb one of these three seasonals, or even if there's four, still, still, it's best case scenario. There's four, and that's still like that's not very much to qualify for. So. I'm very cognizant of that and a little bit worried about it. And that is the reason I'm like trying to push myself. A lot of times, like I kind of just don't want a ladder. Or I don't care that much. And then I'm like, Hey, stupid. You want to do well at seasonals. You're going to be kicking yourself or regretting it for not like kind of getting on it right now. And that is kind of the reason that I'm like pushing myself through this lull to like, kind of like do the work. Also, I would love to like lock up a certain LP and not have to be ladder climbing and preparing for seasonals at the same time come like April. It's definitely rough, um, right? To have to be able to do both. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's asking I, a lot. if you're a good player, you'll just like, you know, top four of the last seasonals, right? That's. Uh, or the uh, first one. Or the first one. <laughs> Easy, bro. Then you can like actually take time off. Um, yeah. But Dude, otherwise, I'm... no, I, I definitely get where you're coming from. I, I think realistically, you know, if they have like a seasonals like beginning of November and then like three weeks later is worlds, I don't think that's like unreasonable. Right. Um, yeah. I guess that but like here's, lands here's on like thing. a Thanksgiving day, but like that makes not. so that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. But again, there are a whole bunch of factors. Yeah. For outside sure. of. No, you know, no. So, I mean, those other games don't matter, bro. Uh, everything it's, else. It's not right even just the other on. games. Doesn't matter. Yeah, other, oh, yeah. Everything else. Just literal no, everything matter. else. Um, but like, you what know, you're missing fighting is that game I would launch. like four seasonals, you know, um, and oh, because okay. I would like it, right? That means it won't it. happen. No, that means it won't happen. Cause whatever you love, I go to riot and I'm like, kill this, kill this immediately. For anyone who doesn't know, Akita was a big expedition lover, huge fan. And I was oh, like, yeah. you need to end I've this immediately. Known for <laughs> it. Um, I'm all about that. Draft Loves that life, expedition bro. life. Yeah. Drafts for days. Well-known magic drafter yeah my bro my Quinn riven expeditions bro that shit was wild <laughs> you, you couldn't anyways you couldn't deal with it anyways i'm i'm concerned about it i'm worried that there's gonna be a mad scramble at, at any rate there's gonna be a mad scramble i, I really can't wait oh, for, for next sure. month when we have a new meta and when people start getting excited about seasonals because like it, it was so weird last year with like a bunch of people already being qualified like majin didn't have um that whole like race to seasonals that a lot of us, most of us had because mm-hmm. he qualified already or the like was post homously. No, that's not how that works. Post was qualified from already top fouring or winning uh, seasonals. And I don't know, just having everyone in the same boat together and being like, okay, hey, seasonals means a whole lot now. Go. I think that's like, I think that's going to be really interesting and really fun. And I can't wait for it. Um, and I'm trying my best to kind of like stay positive and don't let this lull just absolutely kill me and be like, Hey, I got work to do. I can go climb the ladder. I can be doing stuff. I can be learning other decks. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my take on, on worlds. I feel like it's going to be crazy again. And people are kind of sleeping on it. It's definitely going to be crazy, but it's kind of rough, right? Like playing right now. It's like, even if you hit like 700 LP, like it's not going to be on a meta that the next seasonals is going to be on. Right. Um, assumedly, like I assume we're getting like, you know, really big patch and like, 12 days and you know if i'm like grinding right now then what's you know what's that what's the point yeah well i mean to me the ladder is just never even very conducive to like it it helps a little bit but like not a lot for like preparing for tournaments do you think that do you do you think that uh being good at ladder means that you'll be good in tournaments or no no do you think there's any correlation Yes. Okay. I think I think to be good at ladder, you have to be a good player, um, in some regard. Okay. Yeah. If you're like, for instance, I'll I'll throw some people under the bus. Uh, so like BBG was always pretty good at ladder, right? He like was climbing the ladder a lot. Uh huh. Um, but he had very specific decks that he liked to play, in general, and then when it came to tournaments, like his lineups. 
um sometimes we're just kind of like like ah now you can't be playing that deck like that's like or in like well, one of your decks is like off like his lineup wasn't like his lineups were sometimes not cohesive and stuff Bro, and so i feel like Zarya zillion at worlds that was that was the meta call did he do that he brought Zarya zillion to worlds <laughs> i was i was like half i didn't know exactly what his lineups were for all of them i just Probably. knew that they were sussy and like I, I remember seeing one or two of the early ones and being like what like does he not know like you can't be playing you can't be bringing that deck um and that was what i was going off of but yeah like zero zero zilly like case in point i like it was I the medical bro i it was the medical did it work out for him because i don't remember seeing his games in top 16 no well, i mean didn't like, he, so he didn't make it out of like the top 64 right I the know. 64 <laughs> qualifier i think he went like one That's two or something kidding. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're and, and, so, and so that's, yeah, like, oh, it's just, it's another skill. It's another, there are multiple mm-hmm. skills. Um, so like metagaming is extremely important. Like picking the decks and the cards in your deck is extremely important. Just as important as, maybe not just as important, but also very important as playing your decks, right? Like if you pick the best player on the planet, J1, obviously, um, and you give him like a lineup that makes no sense, like he'll only be able to do so well, right? Do you like, think it's you know, one do you think Joe one's the best player on the planet? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think who who is the best. Well, we're a tournament player, best tournament player on the planet, just player or tournament player, however you want to define it. Um, well, I would go tournament player because like ladder player. Well, if you're going to go ladder, I mean, it's probably definitely JL1 because the guy is insane. I've never just watched JL1 play. Ladder. I'm going to be honest with you. The, the most I've watched JL1 play is like Apex Seasonals. I've seen a couple of games and, you know, I. Uh, yeah, right. I've only watched a limited amount. There's definitely I've watched some of his streams and stuff, um, but this is a solid six ish, eight months ago or something. And as much as I'm bad now, I was hot garbage then. And I remember just being like, I have no idea what he's doing. Like, I don't know what's going on here. Like, I don't it's, know why he's making it's a lot so of these hard if you don't like, you know, speak the same language, right? To be able to like follow, uh, you know, what's our what's our idea behind this line? You know, it's very difficult for me personally yeah. to be able to. You know, I, I very much like the collaborative um, thing between like Twitch chat and streamer, where you know you can actually like ask them. You know, it's like, what's the idea here? What are we playing around? What is this line? And, you know, a lot of times there's some players that you know I watch them and I'm like, wow that's a cool fucking line. I would not have seen that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I become impressed by that. You know, it, I, it's hard for me, you know, if you were talking about like best LOR players um, to, you know, talk about someone that you haven't seen a lot of their gameplay. You know, I know that jo ones name gets thrown out a lot, right? You know, you look at it, it's like, oh, he got like a thousand LP on like six different servers or whatever. And it's just like, well, I've yeah. never really like seen anything that's, you know, like super was impressive. He, and like, maybe like just number one on like all the servers at once or something. Like three out of four something like something that yeah what a year ago bro when no one played the game come on uh, I... people are still playing the game <laughs> i know <laughs> but no i i just um, i don't know I, I, that's definitely something i you know think about when it's like you know who is the best player it's like i don't even know i don't i don't know if it's easy to tell yeah i don't know who is the best but back to the original point though um yeah is that there's there's like there's different skill sets that go into like say winning a seasonals, um, or like or making multiple top cuts. Yeah. Um. And so, for instance, like uh, like Allen is a very good technical player, I think. Uh, but a lot of the the decks that he used to pick in the early days, I thought were sus as all hell. Right. Again, <laughs> his his lineups were insane too. It's bringing like karma, whatever, half the time um i don't know like i remember like i seem to recall he oh he brought dragons one time i think in a, in a meta where we were like you just can't bring dragons in this meta like you're just decks like terrible um and so this is something that you see in magic a lot too where there's i know you're not a magic player but there's a guy uh paulo vito devina rosa who was like the last world champion or whatever who's often regarded as like maybe the goat he's like it, he was like there was two guys that were better than him and then, like, he just kept winning, kept playing, and now he's, like, he's right there in the top, whatever, best of all time. Like, I think the conversation now is maybe he's in the top two, top three, for mm-hmm. sure. Maybe he's number one. Um, it's really interesting, though, because he gets a lot of 
there's stories that get told, you know, there's narratives that get told. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a very good writer and he's a very good technical player. But there's more that goes into, like, he's not, I don't think he's known for being like a deck builder, for instance, or a particularly good metagamer. Mm -hmm. And so those things are extremely valuable um, as well as just like your technical play in in the actual game um so like, sure. i don't know like what there, there's like, what am i i think it's like very good at attacking set. metagames right like there's yeah. a lot of things that go into like especially tournaments you know you have to not only be incredibly good player you have to have like a pretty good re on the meta you have to like bring good decks you have to have a good lineup and then you know there's like a certain amount of like luck on the day there's a lot of factors that go into like actually winning a tournament so like just from like sure. a, like a player skill perspective you know i people like alan like i you know i listen to them talk through their lines and i'm like damn, this guy's real fucking good at the game. So we're like, what, what am I, Jordan, you know? Um, or Majin Bay, you know? I, these are players that, like, when I watch them, I'm like, you know, sometimes they do things, I'm like, wow, he's a really good player. Um, yeah. But yeah, even someone like Alan, you know, he's... Has he topped... He's topped one seasonals, right? He won a Worlds. Won, won but a yeah, world. other than Worlds. He, didn't he get to, to Worlds through Ladder? I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if he's I'm not sure if he's top to seals or not. And like I said, like a lot of his lineups and like the definitely the early days of seasonals were sus as hell. And that's yeah. why I think he didn't do particularly well. And and to his credit, um he he started reaching out to some of the other EU players, I think, and started working with them, um, probably realizing that like he needed to make some changes because like he's too damn good to be not performing. Yeah, he's uh, so incredibly seasonals. He's an incredibly great player, right? But, you know, yeah. I feel bad when, you know, a player like that, you know, ends up stealing my my lineup and then not doing well with it. And I'm like, bro, you should have just brought good decks, man. Come on. <laughs> Why are you <laughs> playing my lineup? <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, like his his technical play at Worlds was fantastic. It was yeah. really, really good at the top eight. Really um, but yeah, it just goes to show, though, um, you know, there is there are multiple things that you need to be good at. Um, sure. that's what, what would you say that you're good at? What are your What are your strengths? Not deck building. I don't build decks. No, that's, that's not my thing. Um, but I think I'm good at like I identifying like win conditions and like finding like you know lines to actually win games. Um, I I think yeah. that you know a lot of times you know if we're in like a specific position, I'll be able to like pretty quickly identify like. Okay, well, that's not an option. That's not an option. That's not an option. We kind of have to play specifically towards this, like, you know, three turns from now. This is how we're going to win this game. You know, it's like the only time that we ever win this game. Um, I think that I don't know. It, it's difficult because I feel like a lot of times, you know, I, I look at like what I do and I'm just like, I don't know. I just like play my cards in an okay order sometimes. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to like quantify. Um, you know, it's like, am I actually you... really that good at the game? And then I watch other people play and I'm like, Okay, I'm definitely better, you know, some other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you do you feel like you can tell if a deck is like good or bad or generally powerful or not powerful? I think a lot of the times. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you play a deck enough, like you can kind of tell it's like this deck's really doing like really strong things, or like, you know, it, it, there are also times where I'm like playing a deck that a lot of people are like, this is really good, and I'm playing, I'm like, I don't think I so. It. I think there's like consistency issues. I think there's like power level issues. You know, I'm winning a lot of games, but God, these are like grinds. These are not good games. Like th this is not a deck that I want to be playing against like really strong players. I feel like I have a pretty Nami. okay read on that. So TF Nami's broken. I don't know. <laughs> See, that's the other thing. I feel like one <laughs> of my you, weaknesses, you... I kind of get also... stuck playing decks that I think are incredibly powerful, but you know, like maybe the meta isn't like quite there for them um or you know stuff like that and i ended up like bringing shellfolk and tf nami uh, which i think yeah i think there were good decks but you know i also play like very difficult decks. i i should probably i think that's one of my weaknesses i should just play like more simple decks i should play like simple tier one decks and just like you know fuck it quit S playing you know shit that actually requires simple brain power. tier one decks are where it's at stuff like plunder or thresh nasus oh oh, um, i found uh, i found tlc uh, to be like quite easy to play as well um any of those decks were I hate like all you only have a few decisions here or there you got a basic game plan like you're just gonna do real powerful stuff and blow your opponent out like that's uh that's a recipe for winning 
you don't have to tax your brain too much. Yeah. Um, but like, like Lee Sin Zoe, I love Lee Sin Zoe, but like sometimes you get into some really complex or like auction siver, you can get into some really, really complex um, situations. It happens a lot, actually. And if you haven't put reps in, like a lot of reps, um, it's, it can be really tough. I think Sivir uh, especially seen... like rides the line enough where it's, you know, simple enough that like sometimes you can just smirk down your opponent, but also yeah. has the ability to be like super in depth. You know, sometimes you like find the line, you know, you sit there tanking for like two minutes and it's like, oh my God, if I play these cards exactly like this, we can win, you know, and you find the exact line. It feels great. I love that. It's definitely like more that. forgiving. It's more forgiving. A deck like Zoe Lee Sin, like if you like, oh, you spent two mana two turns ago and like now you die. Because like yeah. you don't have it here for this other thing that you need to do, that for stuff can sure. happen. That happens a little bit less in Sivir. Like you could definitely punt for sure, but the deck will like is generally always doing powerful things. At the end of the um, day, you know you're hitting a, you're you know you're throwing all your guys out there. It's like deal with it, right? As opposed to like Lee Sin's a little bit more surgical in terms of how it's yeah, right. Games, right. Holy man, I didn't realize we've already been going at this for as long as we have. Um okay, wrapping up. <laughs> Do you have any I was trying I wanted to make this a little bit more about ladder and stuff. What are your thoughts real quick on anyone trying to trying to climb ladder? What are the decks you would recommend? You think people should be playing maybe some counter decks to the top stuff. Uh any tips, just rattle it off. Whatever you got. Uh scouts and Tristana Yordan Arms are literally the best decks in the game and you should probably be playing them. Um if you don't want to play them I don't know. Darkness is pretty solid. Um, you know, Pantheon's broken and requires zero brain. So, I mean, just, you know, coin flip your games. Go for it. Um, the most important thing to climbing is, like, your LP number. Just ignore it. Literally ignore it and just take it game by game. It's hard to do. It's much easier said than done. But, like, genuinely, you know, just try and take something from every single game. And ignore the LP because the LP is just going to get you down, especially if you're in Masters and you, you get that minus 25 and you're like, oh, my God, I don't even want to play anymore. It's just not conducive to climbing. You have to ignore it. Um, but yeah, I mean, just play good decks. And that's that's the easiest way. I mean, if you want to be like ultra counter meta, you can play like Caitlyn Ezreal. I don't think that deck's like super good right now, but I don't know. I'm Some people you. think it's okay. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I'm very guilty of that too, especially whenever like whatever your peak is in LP, you're like, I want to get back there. Mm -hmm. I want to get back there and I want to do that. And then no matter what, you feel bad that you're not there. And it's like starts a dark spiral. But yeah, just uh, keep on learning. Ignore the LP completely and, and just keep trying to play good Runeterra and you'll inevitably get there. All right. Yeah. That's it for us today. Be back from Bajin again next week. Thank you, Kato, so much for joining me. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, As man. always, love we'll to have you on again, the three of us. Anytime, man. Anytime. Nice. All right, everyone. Take care. Have a great weekend. Uh, oh, uh, tournament this Sunday, by the way. Come check that out. Master Runeterra dot com details or come to the discord uh so it's at 9 a.m pacific peace